Any chaos? Anybody? Seen any chaos this week? Just a little bit? Yeah. Y'all know that God can take that chaos and he can bring it into order? Y'all know that, right? Yeah. Let's do a review. First place that we see chaos is in creation. Y'all remember this? Day one, he said, let there be light. Y'all gonna have to get better at this because we're gonna do it for a few weeks, okay? He said, let there be light and there was light and he separated the light from darkness and he said, it is good. Y'all got that part. All right, day two. <laughs> he took the waters, he separated them above and below. And in the midst of that, he created an expanse of which is the skies. He called the heavens and it was day two. Y'all were so helpful today. And he said, it is day three. He was like, man, that's a lot of water. Maybe we should make some land. So he makes land and vegetation, separates, <coughs> excuse me, the water from the land. And it's day three. It is What's he do on day four? Talk to me, people. The sun, moon, and the stars places them in the light and the dark to separate day from night. Is it good? Yes. Listen, if my drawing ain't good, it's the best you're going to get. So just say, it is? Good. That's day four. Day five. Birds and the fishes places them in the sky and the water. Day five. Do you see the order? And it is. <laughs> then he created a man to hunt that deer in the name of Jesus. No, just <laughs> that was a joke. And if you don't understand that, I'm sorry. But he created animals and he created mankind. Placed them on that land, once again, order, and said, it is not just good. I looked at all of his creation, and he said, it is very good. It's a good, good review, right? It's good to know. So we're going to take this, and we're going to continue, because we see order in uh, creation, but I want us to remember that order creates good. Like he took that and he ties good to order. We see it time and time again. God is good all the time. Oh, come on. You ain't old school Baptist if you don't know that one. God is good all the time. All the time. So we know that God is good. And Jesus even says, you know, mankind doesn't have goodness in it apart from God. And God is a God of order, not of chaos or of confusion. Amen? So order creates good. We see it in creation. We see it in the plan of salvation. Because when sin stepped in, <clears throat> all the crazy came. And he said, I'm not going to leave you this way. I want you all to understand that redemption was a part of his plan. And one day restoration will be as well. Y'all grab a hold of that, okay? Anybody taking notes? Because I may actually just share something new with you today, all right? So take what you learned last week, let's add it to this and make it one big message. You ready for that? Get, get this, Jesus steps into the scene and he is God in flesh, right? So he shows us order. Feeding of the 5,000, did you know it is, I've stated this before, but maybe you didn't know this. It's apart from the resurrection, the only miracle of Jesus that shows up in all four gospels. It shows up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did y'all know that? Watch this. In Luke, he shows that Jesus is a God of order because what he says is, all right, I'm gonna break it. Disciples come here. The disciples, he broke the bread, handed it to them, and he said, now have them sit down in groups of 50. Does that sound like order? Those of you that are gift, gifted with administration and order right now, you're like, thank you, Jesus, for having them sit in groups of 50, right? You know what I'm saying? It's like you went, yes. 
And so he's like, he does that in order, but then he feeds them. And then when they come back, they bring back 12 baskets full. And it's this beautiful image of a miracle that was done in order. I think all of that's intentional. I think it's very intentional that he said this miracle is so important that you, ready for this? Understand it's a creation miracle because he created more out of nothing. Y'all remember that, right? Enough to feed 5,000. So it's a creation miracle. And he said, and we're going to do it in order. Y'all see that? Are you, are you good with me? So if order creates good, what creates chaos? Uh Uh-huh. Selfishness. I'm going to let y'all stare at that for a second. Because you're going, I don't know if I get it. But you know, at the very core of sin is self. Why would they eat of that fruit? Oh, God doesn't want us to be like him. Now you could say all of that selfishness, the root of it is pride. Amen. Amen. But at the core of it, what's the opposite of love? You're like, no, it's hatred. Those are the emotions that come out. But the opposite of love is selfishness. I can prove that. There's no greater love than this than to lay down your life for another. Does that sound like the opposite of selfishness? 100%. And to love others, sometimes we have to sacrifice what we want to love them. Y'all look like y'all don't like this message. (laughs) But isn't this the life that he's called us to? Is to honor and to love others? Listen, you can see the cycle of selfishness and chaos in the book of Judges. This week, sit down and read the whole book. I didn't see any takers. Okay, so go and read Judges. You know what happens? There's a cycle that occurs. The cycle looks like this. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Y'all remember this? There was no king in Israel. By the way, if we are followers of Jesus, there's a king in your life. His name is? This side ain't participating. What's up with that? His name is? Jesus, if he's the king of our life, then we're surrendering to him and to his will, not to our own self. And so we see a cycle that occurs, and it's this selfishness that turns into sin. Y'all remember this? So everybody did what's right in their own eyes, and sin seeps into the camp. And then so God goes, oh, you don't need me. So he hands them over to an enemy that oppresses them. It's chaos. So what do they do? Cry out to God. And you know what? The God of order loves them enough to listen. And then he brings a judge and brings order back into their life. Over and over and over and over. I know y'all are the nine o'clock crowd, but you are awake. And over and over. And the last verse of Judges is Judges 21, 25. There was no king in Israel. So what did they do? Whatever what was, was right in their own eyes. He was like, I'm summing up the whole book of Judges in one verse. Over and over. And that's why we needed a redeemer. Or we get stuck in this cycle. We have a tendency to look back in the Old Testament and go, man, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with us? Like, we are so quick to point a finger at them and say, I I mean, we even, they crucified Jesus. I wouldn't have done that. What? I would have been like in the crowd. Where's the crowd going? Anybody with me? We have that tendency, right? Right. So we got to be real careful not to judge them. Why? Because we are caught in the same cycles sometimes. Anybody see yourself in the stories? And I know what we do. We see ourselves in this story. There's David and Goliath, and I'm David. I'm going to kill that giant. Y'all see yourself right there, right? 
We're like, I'm David. What if you were to look at the story properly? I'm not David. I'm an Israelite standing up there shaking in my boots. And Jesus went down and he defeated the giant. You you see, we oftentimes put ourselves in the story, but we put ourselves in the story in a good light. I'm not trying to talk anybody down. I'm just saying, let's be real. I love you enough. We need a savior. We need a warrior. We need a lion. We need a lamb. And so he sent Jesus to be that perfect, spotless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's us. Thank you, Jesus. So you see that cycle, and if we're not careful, we can fall into that as well. Can I, can I read to y'all what it's going to look like in the end times? Well, I went to church today, and Pastor Eric was going to encourage us, and then he read from the Bible. I'm not, these aren't my words. Y'all ready? 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you really want some encouragement, crack this open and read it sometime. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Dare I say chaos. For people will be lovers of self. Just just let the words speak for themselves. I'm just, think about what we're in the midst of right now, right? Lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant, abusive. (laughs) Here we go. Disobedient to parents. Ungrateful. And you know what's funny? The whole time we're reading this, we're thinking about somebody else. (laughs) I caught you. I caught you. We're automatically pointing the finger somewhere else, but this is the culture that we live in, right? So we got to ask, Lord, if this is in me, please. Here's what I love. We are in the process of being sanctified as believers. This is all about a sanctification process, and that's what chaos to order is for a believer. You all want me to read those again? No. (laughs) Here we go, here we go. Ungrateful, unholy, Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal. Here it is. Not loving good. Does that fall in line with what we've been talking about for the last two weeks? Treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is an interesting one because I think it can really speak to the church. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray. Get this. By various passions. That's one of the biggest issues we have in our culture today is people are just being led by their passions. Always learning, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Now, this is interesting. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, y'all know that those were those magicians that were opposing Moses. When God would do a miracle, they would come up and put Kool-Aid in the water and say, we have blood in the water too. As they oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all. As was that of those two men. Hey, I want to keep reading. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience. Now this is Paul writing to Timothy. 
my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured yet from them, all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire, are you ready for this? To live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Well, I went to church today and Pastor Eric just totally encouraged me. You know what I encourage you to do? Stand up for the truth no matter what anybody else says. Even if it brings persecution. Why? Because this is a temporary life. We were created for eternity. True order will occur when everything is not just redeemed but restored. While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you, you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here it is. All scripture is breathed out by God himself. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? That you and I, the man of God, the mankind, the men and women of God, may be complete, equipped for every single good work. So, as we're processing the fact that we are living in chaos because Scripture said it was going to happen... Then we ask the question, how should we respond to the chaos in our lives? You want to do that? Yeah. But first, let me ask you this. What has caused this chaos? I think we need to do some introspection first. You want to do that? Everybody sit up straight. Everybody got you, you good? I do that with kids, by the way. If, you, if you're listening, sit up straight. And I noticed none of y'all sat up. <laughs> you're like, I, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. No. Watch this. Three causes of chaos. Now, Brian McDowell, I'm going to give you credit for this, man. When we were sitting and we were talking, uh, Brian wrote this sermon outline for us, and it was super powerful. Watch this. You can, you can get these, actually, from Revelation chapter 2 when Jesus is talking to the church of Ephesus because he'll show us how to respond to these things. But the first thing, first cause is, do I have sin in the world? Is there sin in the world? Is there sin in the world around me? Scripture says it's going to happen, right? So we know one of the causes from the very beginning when man fell, chaos came because of sin in the world. But we can't point it all at the world. We have to take the next one and ask, do I have sin in my life? Because sometimes I'm creating chaos in my life, right? And then finally, and this was the one that I really loved, Brian, when you brought this out, is sometimes you're just battling the darkness. Sometimes you're pushing back on the enemy. Sometimes you're taking back territory that he has stolen. Sometimes you're in the battle. There's a fight. And because of that, there's chaos. But you've been called to the fight. To bring the truth against the lies. So not all of it's bad stuff. Sometimes it's because you're pushing back the enemy. Your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers. And it says in the heavenlies, we're going to pierce the darkness sometimes. Be the tip of the spear. So how should we respond? You ready? I'm going to give you three R's. Are you ready? Remember, repeat, resolve. These all tie to what we just said. So you have sin in the world. So what do we do? We remember that there's sin in the world, but we also remember that there's a Savior that came to redeem us. So the opposite of remembering is dismembering. So I'm going to take this sheet of paper because I, I kind of like to keep that one for later, all right? So I'm going to take this sheet of paper I'm going to place it in a frame. Sometimes we have to frame the truth up in our lives. Make sense? So the truth is he brings order to creation. You know that, right? And we need to remember that. 
Well, what the enemy does is he comes along and he likes to dismember. He likes to tear the truth apart. He likes to take the truth and just begin to shred it and to dismember it and to do anything he can to get us not to believe the truth. But I love how Jesus, when he's tempted with the lies, he takes and he remembers Remembers the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> As little pieces of flakes fall out. But listen, he, he told us that we're to remember and not to allow the enemy to dismember the truth in our minds in our hearts and to walk in that truth. That's the freedom that we have. Amen? Amen. And so we need to remember, yes, there is chaos in this world because sin came into the world, but there is a redeemer who was put in place to set us free from sin and from death. Jesus said, when you sit down and eat of this, do this to remember. And you go to the, the church of Ephesus and Jesus is talking to his own church in Revelation and he says, remember from which you came. Remember what you came from. Go back to that. And the next thing he says is, then repent. So repentance is a part of this and it's tied specifically to the sin in my life. I can tell you scripture after scripture, but you know it points, the, the word of God points towards when there's sin in my life that I need to confess it. I need to repent it. I, I need to say, God, I, I'm going to take responsibility for my own actions and quit blaming everybody else. This was mine, and I'm owning it, and I'm sorry. Repentance is crucial. It's crucial for us to walk in freedom. Amen? Do you realize that repentance is acknowledging the truth? See, if I'm not voicing the truth about something that I did, then I'm just lying to myself and everyone else. But repentance requires me coming to the truth that I did do that and I do need to be forgiven. And truth brings that freedom, amen? And then the third one is resolve. And you see that when Paul talks to Timothy, he talks about, you've seen my actions. Yes, I've been persecuted, but... I am resolved. You see it, the church of Ephesus, where he talks about, I, I know who you are. I've seen what you've done. You've had resolve on a number of things. You've fallen short on some, so you need to repent. You need to remember. And this is what God's called us to. So let me take this and, and put it in practical sense. Y'all want to put it in practical sense? Yeah. So you have chaos in your life. Anybody? You just testify? You just, can I get a witness? Got some chaos in your life. See, now you've asked the question, what is this chaos? What's, what's going on? What's it tied to? What's the cause of it? Is it because of the world that I'm living in? Is it because of what's in my heart? Or is it because I'm doing what God wants me to do and we're pushing back the enemy? You got that, right? So you respond. How do you respond? One of those three things. Remember, re, uh, repent, and resolve. But let's look at it this way. You're on the boat with Jesus. All the waves are going on around you. Y'all remember this? Yeah. All the waves are going on. The wind's blowing. Everything's crazy. And Jesus, where's he at? Doggone it. He's sleeping in the back of the boat. Right? So here's what happens. I see and I perceive the wind and the waves. The first step, practical step, is to step back from the boat, from the edge of the boat, and start moving backwards. Um, any counselors in the house? Katie, I see you and you don't want to admit it, but you're a counselor. So they tell you to walk people back from the ledge when you get into crisis counseling. Y'all have ever done crisis counseling before? When I worked on my master's, they were like, basically it comes down to this. People will come to you and they're highly emotional. They call you up and they're like, 
And you're like, I have no idea what you just said, but that was extreme. And, and they're highly emotional. And I'm not trying to, to dog anybody. That's just what happens. We get perplexed and we get anxious, and, right? You been there? Step back. Step back. Breathe for a second. Do not be reactive. We're called to respond. So don't be quick to react. Just step back. Dare I say... Because the next step is to rest. Rest in the truth, meditate on the truth, either one, whichever is going to work for you. God has called us to Sabbath. The word Sabbath in the original language is Sabbat, and it means stop. You want me to translate it for you again? Stop. <laughs> quit walking towards the ledge, quit, just stop. And he says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come into his presence. Take a moment, step back from the wind and the waves. And remember, Jesus is in the boat with you. Now, you may not have heard his voice yet. I mean, how dare he be asleep, right? But that truth is inside of you. Step back from what you see and breathe for a second. And I thought this was great. Shell brought this up in our staff meeting as well. I think it's important for you to understand that it's okay to call a friend who will speak truth into you. Rest does not mean you have to do it alone. You can have Sabbath and rest with others that you trust. But don't call that person, you know what I'm talking about, that person to get them on your side about the thing you know you're not supposed to be doing. You need someone in your life who will look at you and say, sweetheart, friend, you are out of line. You need somebody in your life who loves you enough to say, whoa, 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 I see a lot of emotions, but I'm not hearing any truth. You, what if we start calling those people? You know what will happen? They'll start praying for you in a moment of chaos. And you know what that will do? Start the wheels turning for healing. Start the wheels turning for restoration, redemption in your life. Sanctification. Believers, to be holy as he is holy requires us to keep walking in sanctification. So rest in the truth. Meditate on the truth. Wake up the truth inside of you. And then the final one is, then respond accordingly, according to the truth. What if we did this? Y'all want to try it? You're like, oh, you mean right now? No, I mean this week when the chaos starts to spin. You're like, well, I don't know that any will. <laughs> Welcome to life. The chaos starts to spin around you. I find it interesting that the scripture tells us to not be anxious about anything. Y'all ever taken this verse and been like, but Lord, you don't know about this. Okay, so it says, do not be anxious about anything. That means nothing. Don't be anxious about nothing. That's probably bad grammar, but it felt right. Don't be anxious about anything, but through prayer and petition. Step back from the ledge. Step back from the emotion. Step back from the moment and go, okay, I'm not going to react in emotion. I'm going to step back and I'm going to be mature. And I'm going to spend some time in this presence. And I'm going to call people who will speak the truth in my life. I'll spend some time in the Word. I will ask the Spirit of God to give me an answer on how to respond. I'll spend time alone to get Spirit of God to speak into me. I will have people around me that will affirm those things. And then I'll know how to respond to the chaos. Y'all, we're, we're in the season of revival and guess what? The enemy hates it. Hates it. So what's happening? <laughs> There's some crazy going on. 
as the spirit's moving, the enemy is pushing back and we're going, okay, God. I mean, can I just be brutally honest with you? Is that okay? Like, I, th- I think we're family. Can, you, can I trust you for a second? Sometimes I just want to punch people. Can, can I say that? And I'm, listen, it has nothing to do with y'all. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about sometimes like when the enemy pushes back in the community or something, y'all are like, pastor says he's going to punch me. That, had, that is not what I said. Listen, what I'm saying is sometimes there are people that come against the church and I just want to tackle them. I, I want to put a hurting on them. You're like, but you weigh a buck 50. Listen, I, I may be scrawny, but I'm wiry. And then, you know, sometimes I just, you just want a chokehold. And he said, no, 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 that's not how. See, your battle's not against flesh and blood. Step back. Stop. Rest in me. And I'll show you how to respond. And this is, this makes me so mad. I love my Jesus, but he makes me mad sometimes, okay? Because I, I typically, when I have to respond, he always makes me respond in humility. I mean, I had some good words for them, Lord. I even dreamed about it. You know what I'm saying? It was like I had a vision. And he goes, no, and this is what we talked about this week. He says, no, wash their feet. When you sit down and you talk to them, start in a posture of humility and watch what I can do. Mm. But it takes stepping back from the edge of the boat and remembering that Jesus is here. Jesus, would you just wake up the truth in me so that I can walk in that truth? It's going to be a good week. You know how I know that? Because you said you'd accept the challenge. It's going to be a good week. As we go out into the community, we're going to be different than we were when we walked in the doors today. We're we're not going to be reactive. We're we're not going to push back on the chaos. Some of y'all looking at each other like, I know. No, leave each other alone. This message is for you, not for the person beside you, okay? So, and let's take this challenge and let's walk into this community different. Step back from the chaos. Church, church, I need need you to hear me. Don't feed the chaos. Church, don't, don't feed the chaos. We're a part of the solution, not the problem.